many people do we have? Welcome to Tales of Cape Cod Summer Speaker Series. My name is Gene Gwill. I'm the president of, of the board of Tales of Cape Cod. This evening's program is sponsored by Lucy Loomis and Dan Santos. Please join me in giving Lucy and Dan a special wave of thank you for their sponsorship. Um, as an all-volunteer organization that is struggling to figure out a path in this world of social distancing and virtual gatherings, we appreciate our sponsors more than ever. Um, through our sponsors, our membership, our donors, and our participants in our programs, such as this one, we're able to continue to develop our programming and ultimately raise funds to restore this historic building. In addition to learning the techniques of live streaming, we have also learned how to place our older programs, the previous programs, on a pay-per-view channel. Please check our website, talesofcapecod.org, to see what programs are currently available. Then pick a program and pretend it's Saturday night at the, at the movies any night of the week. Our program tonight is titled, Reverend John Lothrop, A Retrospective. When Barnstable was settled in 1639, the original land grants were given to two individuals, Reverend Joseph Hall and Thomas Dimmock. Both individuals arrived in Barnstable in the spring of 1639. They built fortified houses to, pro to provide protection for the settlers in case of attacks by Native Americans. Reverend Hall's fortified house was located on the west side of Barnstable Village, what we now know as Barnstable Village, roughly across the street of the, from the Lothrop Cemetery. Thomas Demick's fortified house was located on the east side of Barnstable Village, roughly across the street from the organic farm. Um, we think it was probably located on the site of Ned and Sue Handy's site or their property the site of their house or their property. In the fall of 1639, another group of settlers arrived in Barnstable. This group came from Situate. They were all members of the same church. They numbered approximately 22 families and they were led by Reverend John Lothrop. The new settlers cleared land, built their homes and for the most part, tended to settle around the fortified houses of Reverend Hull and Thomas Dimmock. Reverend Lothrop, however, settled between the two clusters of houses. His first home was located roughly at the site of what is now the Barnstable Tavern. Uh, he expressed dissatisfaction in this home, with this home and the, uh, his church members built him a new home which is now part of the Sturgis Library. Reverend Lothrop lived for 14 years in Barnstable. When he died, it was said he was a gentle, kindly man and beloved by all who knew him. Our speaker this evening will fill in the details of Reverend Lothrop's life and legacy. Our speaker is Gordon Lothrop, a direct descendant of Reverend John Lothrop. Gordon lives in Marblehead, he is a retired veteran from the US Navy. He is a graduate of Clark University in Worcester and worked for many years with IBM, Wang Laboratories and Andover Controls. Gordon is a member of the board of the Lothrop Family Foundation and published the family newsletter for 12 years. Please join me in welcoming Gordon Lothrop. Thanks, Jane. Oh, here we are. Uh, thank you again, Jane, for that uh, introduction. It was uh, 
very kind of you to say those things. Um, so I guess we need to get into it. And I, I will say up front, this is a whole new experience for me. Zoom, television, remote control, the whole thing. Anyway, uh, here we go. Um, I think it's worth spending a little time on the origin of the family name. Um, it's from a place called Lothorpe, uh, near, actually near a town called Beverly, which is east of York. I've been to this town. Uh, it's sweet. There's about eight buildings in the whole place, including an old church. Two large farms, which probably go back a thousand years. Who knows? Um, one time there was a mill there, and I based that the fact that there's a street, main street, called Mill Street. You know, the folks in those days were very literal. So anyway, uh, in that time, most of the people that lived in the area were of Danish or Nordic descent. And many of the towns in the area have the Thorpe uh, ending of the place name. <clears throat> And that means an outlying farmstead, which is it's just a remote place. And uh, there's some debate about the low part. It may or may not mean low, but I've been there and there's nothing low about it. There's nothing higher relative to the area. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of those mysterious things, the Reverend John Lothrop, He's the only person that we know of that regularly used a double P at the end. Well, his son Samuel used Lathrop with the A after relocating to Connecticut. Um, I did some research one time and there's about 15,000 people in the United States and Canada that have some variation of the name. About 3,000 Lothrop's LO and about 12,000 LA's. So obviously that branch of the family was much more prolific. Um, the first time I ever heard of a Lathrop was when I was working for IBM. There was a fellow that uh, worked in the same office that I did. His last name was Lathrop and he was from uh, Northbridge in central Massachusetts. And that's when I discovered that a lot of people in Connecticut and central Massachusetts with the family name, spelled it with the L-A. So life's an ongoing education. Anyway, um, in putting this together, I was reminded that there's an old saying about we suffer three deaths. It's when your heart stops and when they put you in the ground, and when nobody speaks your name anymore. And uh, with that said, the Reverend John Walter, and I, I don't know how that happened, uh, should have been L.O., but anyway, it's very much alive after 367 years. And that's quite a testament right there. Um, I thought it'd be worth taking a couple of minutes to discuss what happened to our calendar. Um, in the year 45 BC, Julius Caesar, there's another fellow that lived a long time after his death, if you will. He was only emperor for two years and we're still talking about him. But anyway, um, he put into effect something that sort of resembles the modern calendar with the new year starting on January 1st. The only thing that they didn't really plan on very well was the leap year thing. And they just, uh, every four years, they added a leap year. So by the middle of the 15th century, they were 10 days out of sync. So every 128 years, they picked up an extra day. So Pope Gregory uh, was concerned because the calendar and the liturgical calendar were out of sync. So Easter was happening before the spring equinox and like that. So he proposed uh, a new calendar system, which um, 
basically uh, took 10 days out of the month of October. And uh, after that, uh, we had a leap year every four years, except years that were divisible by, um, ended in double zero, unless it was divisible by 400, like the year 2000, or 2020, or yeah, the 2000, um, we had a leap year, ordinarily we wouldn't, because it had a triple zero. Um, anyway, the steps to put it together was um, on December 31st in 1750 was followed by January 1st, 1750 under the old style calendar. At that time, December was the 10th month of the year with January being 11th. So as a side note, when you look at, the, at our calendar, October means 8th. December is the 10th month. So uh, we're stuck with that. It's not a real problem as long as we know what it means. But um, as we progressed in, uh, in England to get back in sync with the rest of Europe, which was Catholic and more or less governed by what the Pope thought. And of course, England at that time had separated from the Roman Church, so they were doing their own thing. And then uh, December 31st, 1751 was followed by January 1st, 1752, which switched from the March 25th date, which is exactly nine months from Christmas. So the, the um, 25th date is the uh, celebration, if you will, of the Archangel Gabriel visiting the Virgin Mary with the news that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. So a lot of things got changed there. But in September of 1752 in England, uh, <clears throat> those 10, 11 days actually dropped from the calendar. So we went from September 2nd to September 14th overnight. And so that was in harmony with the Gregorian calendar. Um, I've heard stories about people were rioting because they thought they were getting cheated out of eight days or 11 days of life. Uh, that's more of an urban legend, I think. Uh, there's many uh, notable descendants of the Reverend John uh, Ulysses Grant, Franklin Roosevelt, both of the Bushes, a bunch of governors. Um, I'm not going to read the whole list. Uh, but anyway, it's a very distinguished family and group, what have you. We should talk briefly about um, Reverend John Lothrop and his family's trip from England to the New World. Um, on the list, the passenger list, regrettably, the original list has been lost. So what we have is uh, somebody's uh, copy of it. <clears throat> but um, two things interesting there. One is, it, it mentions the Reverend John Lothrop and his wife. Now, we all heard that his first wife had passed away in England, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, and then um, his son, John, was among the people that um, traveled with him to America. But um, apparently, either he wasn't on the ship or he went back to England because at the end of Reverend John's life, he made mention of his son in England, his son John in England. And um, somewhere along the way, he had another son who he also named John. So that adds a little bit of mystery and confusion there between the second wife and the second son, John. We should also talk about what's a free man. 
we uh, we've heard the term somebody was admitted as a free man what exactly does that mean it sounds like somebody that's basically free to do what they want go where they want uh, and it's more or less true um, started in the 12th century in Europe and basically what it means is um, they have no obligations either indentured or probationary um, <clears throat> In the Puritan Church, which is not Plymouth County, um, they everybody that was a freeman in the church was allowed to vote. I mean, they had to be free of debt and owe nothing to anybody except God Himself. And um, it was a common term in American colonial areas, especially in the Puritan towns, not in the separatist towns, which is what Plymouth County was. And in, um, in Plymouth Colony, church membership was not requ uh, explicitly required uh, to be a free man. Uh, that was one of the many dif differences in the way the two areas were um, organized. So, for you folks who live in the area, I'm sure you've seen this sign a few times. It was installed in 1939, um, and regrettably, it doesn't have the double P at the end. That's just my personal view. Um, but um, it's, it's a real testimony. Um, it says a few things about him being a pastor in the Church of England, and and like that, but he um, he was baptized on December 20th, 1584. And the way they kept records in those days, he was usually baptized on the Sunday following the day of birth. So he could have been born on December 14th or 18th or one of those days before December 20th, 1584. And that's how they kept the records. Anyway, he did die on November 8th in 1653, 69 years later. Um, he started out as an Anglican clergyman and um, became what eventually would be termed a congregational minister. At the time, they were independents. And the main difference between the independents and the Puritans was the Puritans still regard themselves as members of the Church of England, just a pure form of the faith, where the independents separated themselves from the Church of England completely. Um, <clears throat> Reverend John was the 12th child of Thomas Lothrop, <laughs> and another variation of the spelling, uh, of Terry Burton and East Riding in Yorkshire. And I've been there, lovely little town. Doesn't look very old, but it's, it's a cute place. Um, anyway, his mother, we're not sure if it was Mary, Maria, or Maud, uh, who was his father's second wife, died in Etten in 1588. Uh, Reverend John, from the records, uh, was married the first time in October 10th, 1610, to Hannah House, or House, H-O-W-E-S, and he was a, she was the daughter of John House and his wife, Alice, and uh, John House was um, a minister in a nearby church, so I guess Hannah knew what she was getting into when she married somebody in the clergy. And as near as we can figure out, he was again married in Situate in 1635 uh, after Hannah's death. So John had 16 children by two wives. The first eight by his wife Hannah, and there were eight children by, we think it was endemic or maybe Hammond. <laughs> I guess people's handwriting was pretty bad in those days. Anyway, uh, six of the eight 
uh, survive um, adulthood. Um, unfortunately, two unnamed children were uh, stillborn, a boy and a girl, one in 1638, the other in 1649. Um, Richard Price, who did a biography of John Lothrop, uh, commented that his spiritual and political strength not only was emulated by his sons and his daughters, but it is evidenced by the lives of thousands of his descendants in the past four centuries. As I mentioned earlier, there were the list includes presidents, a prime minister of Canada, authors, financiers, politicians, and key leaders in various religious groups throughout the centuries. I'll talk a little bit about John Lothrop's life before he went to prison. Um, apparently, he came from a wealthy and well-connected family. Uh, his grandfather and father owned extensive acreage uh, in and around Etten. And uh, apparently, the family was pretty well off financially. Um, his brother Thomas and, and John both were attending college, Queens College, at the same time. And I imagine going to college in those days was expensive the way it is now. Um, but anyway, uh, after receiving his degree in 1609, that would have been a master's degree, John Lothrop became the perpetual curate of the Egerton Church in Kent. And that was the last Anglican parish where he would serve. In 1623, he left the Church of England and subscribed to the doctrines of the independence. In 1624, he was called to be the second pastor of the first independent Church of England. That's when he was, he succeeded the Reverend Henry Jacob as pastor of that first church society in London. Henry Jacob was one of the Puritans who had fled the Leiden in the Netherlands before 1616 to avoid persecution, but he returned to England in 1620 when a portion of his church moved to Plymouth, Massachusetts. In 1625, uh, Charles I became king. And um, Charles tried to confirm, conform all political and religious institutions so that they were all the same. He sold monopolies, titles, church positions to the highest bidder, and levied fines against those who refused to take the oath of allegiance. And that had to do with the um, <clears throat> adherence to the Church of England. And um, anybody that was not a member of the true apostolic church were excommunicated. Those were the lucky ones. Uh, to this end, Charles I appointed Bishop Lawn as the Archbishop of Canterbury and empowered him to reform the entire Church of England. Lawn established a uniform system of worship where he imposed on all Englishmen. He had burned the books and pamphlets that did not pass his censorship and ordered inspection tours in parish churches to ensure the use of the Book of Common Prayer. So, uh, leading up to the arrest in 1632, so the Reverend John Lothrop had um, been the minister of the Independent Church for eight years, uh, and they usually met at a home of a man by the name of Humphrey Barnett of Blackfriars, Blackfriars, rather, excuse me, a neighborhood in London on the south side of the Thames, um, where they usually met. Bishop Laud sent agents to arrest the group, and they seized 42 of them, 18 escaped. The, the ones that were captured went to the Newgate prison, which was a really severe prison built for felons. Um, by 1634, most of the group had been released on bail, 
except for the Reverend John Lothrop, who finally procured his liberty on the occasion of his wife's sickness. He was paroled and had to return to prison after she died shortly thereafter. And uh, his main mission was to comfort his wife, Hannah, in her dying moments and offer her soul up to God uh, for salvation. Um, after he returned to prison, his children were placed with the Bishop of Lambeth. And he was finally granted liberty to go into foreign exile on 24th of April in 1634. Family joke is that he was offered a choice between a short walk or a long boat ride. Um, fortunately, he took the option of taking the ship. Uh, he came to America on the Griffin, as I mentioned earlier. Um, some records say that only six of his seven living children and 32 members of the church landed in Boston. So, upon arriving in Boston, which is where the Griffin landed, he met with Governor John Winthrop, who commented on Reverend Lothrop as being praised with modesty and reserve of one who had so prominently and ably, so fearlessly upheld the Puritan faith. Well, I guess not, as he was an independent, but it sounded good. Um, on 27th of September, 1634, Reverend Lothrop moved to a settlement of nine houses in a place called Situate, where they had a meeting house uh, which was also the largest home, belonged to Mr. James Cudworth, who uh, lived from 1604 to 1680. Uh, and Cudworth became one of the area's uh, leading military figures. Uh, <clears throat> the settlement at Situate was increased by a large addition in the summer of 1635, mainly by a new immigration from Kent, which is where Reverend John Lothrop's uh, past uh, Anglican parish was. Um, and, uh, January 29, 1635, in that private dwelling by votes of the brethren assembled, Mr. Lothrop was formally chosen as the minister of the place. And by laying on their hands, he was fully believed to be the true apostolic manner once induced in the pastoral office. Uh, the people that lived in Situate at that time refer to themselves as the men of Kent. And in Situate, there is a cemetery called the Men of Kent Cemetery. And I've been there many times. And it's quite spiritually moving. And if you've not been there, it's worth a trip up there just to take it in. It's, it's quite, uh, quite moving. Um, there was some controversy about baptism in the church, whether it should be a full immersion or a sprinkle of water, sometimes referred to as the sprinklers or the dunkers. Um, I think the Reverend John was more in the sprinkle thing. Um, it would have been terrifying to fully immerse your infant child in a bucket of water. So um, there was also a lot of controversy about grazing the cattle. Um, been a situate many times, and um, there's just not a lot of grazing land. Um, down here in Barstable, on the other hand, you've got hundreds of acres of what looks like grassland of some type. And cattle are basically woodland creatures. They don't live on anything. Um, the idea of the well-trimmed, mowed pasture that we think of uh, in modern times is not the way it was in those times. So between the baptism and the problem with um, grazing land for cattle, um, Mr. Lozer uh, decided that he needed to petition uh, for a better area for his flock and his herd. 
So uh, originally they were thinking about a place called um, Sipaton, and which is down near Marion, Massachusetts. And um, for whatever reason, it fell through. And um, this area uh, in Barnstable, which was known as Manakees at the time, became available. So um, the people were really good at working together. They decided that they would come down here in the fall after the harvest in Situate. But some people from Situate came down here early to build some housing for people when they came. And the bulk of the people came here with the crops uh, from that particular harvest, along with 80 head of cattle. Now, you can imagine walking 80 head of cattle and probably 40, 50 people, women and children and men from Situate to here, it's quite an undertaking. Fortunately, what's now the um, Cape Cod Canal was one of these places where at high tide it was full of water and at low tide uh, you could walk across. So they drove their cattle across and came down. Notes about Reverend John Lothrop's examples. Uh, he was distinguished for his worldly wisdom and for his piety. He was a good businessman, and so were his sons. He said that wherever one of the family pitched his tent, the spot would soon become a center of business. And the land in his vicinity appreciated its value, and the men, it's the men that make the place, and to Mr. Lothrop, is uh, certainly true. Barnstable is more than indebted to him than any other family. Whatever the exceptions may take to Mr. Lothrop's theological opinions, all must admit that he was a good and true man, an independent thinker, a man who held opinions in advance of his times, even in Massachusetts, a half a century had not elapsed since his opinions on religious tolerance have been adopted by the legislature. Um, <clears throat> one thing I have to say about John Lothrop, uh, he was a tolerant man. Um, I, I think that uh, if he was in Essex County in Massachusetts, there probably would not have been a witch trap trial. Um, one thing I had read was that sometime in the 1640s, um, word got out that there was a colony, if you will, a colony of Quakers that had set up on the west side of town. And um, some people were a little concerned about that. So he said, well, I don't know much about them. He sent a contingent over to sit in and a couple of their services, and they reported back, and they said, What's the problem? Uh, bear in mind that in Boston, there were a few people that were Quakers that were hanged. Really amazing, considering the Puritans wanted free and independent, but only as long as it uh, conformed to their view. Uh, unlike in Plymouth Colony, which was much more tolerant. To become a member of John Lothrop's church, you, you didn't have to sign a creed or make a confession of faith. Everybody retained their freedom. People professed their faith in God and promised uh, that it should be consistent to endeavor to keep his commandments, the 10 that we know about, and live a pure life and walk with love. Um, Oops. Oops. Um, John Lothrop died in Barcival, November 8, 1653. The last entry in his church records in his own handwriting 
was in um, June 15th, 1653. Um, a note about his his church records, which were handwritten, but somehow or other, that book wound up in the hands of Ezra Stiles, who was the ninth um, president of Yale College. And he copied the notes, his notes, and the original text is lost. So what is available is Stiles' um, copy of John Lothrop's note. It'd be lovely to see John Lothrop's notes in his own hand. Uh, anyway, John Lothrop made a will, and, uh, but he never signed it. Uh, but without objection, it was admitted to probate. And a letter of uh, administration was uh, granted on March 7th, 1653 or four, depending on whether he was in the new system or the old system, uh, to Mrs. Lathrop, spelled L-A-Y-T-H-O-R-P. They just can't seem to get that name right, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Interesting. John Lothrop left to his wife his new dwelling house, which is now part of the Sturgis Library. And his oldest son, Thomas, uh, the house in which he first lived in Barnstable. And to his son, John, in England, and son, Benjamin, here, each a cow and five pounds. And I wonder whether they actually delivered that cow to the guy in, in England. That's funny to think about. And to his daughter, Jane and Barbara, uh, he had already given them their portion. And to the rest of the children, his children and his wife's children, apparently his wife had children. Uh, when they married, everybody got a cow. And uh, each child also a book according to their age and the rest of the library to be sold so an honest man can tell how to use it and the proceeds divided. Um, been a few books written about John Lothrop. Um, one that's very well known is Exiled by Helen Holt, um, the story of John Lothrop. She spells it with the A. I asked her about that, why she did that. Uh, I'm a little sensitive about it. And she said, because more people would recognize the name. Uh, I'll give her that. Um, a new book called The Pulse of His Soul, the story of John Lothrop spelled the way that he spelled it, The Forgotten Father, Forefather by Orr Smith, and two other books, The Soul of Courage and The Soul of Faith by uh, Jeanette Ross. Uh, I've read The Soul of Courage. I have not had a copy of The Soul of Faith yet. Um, Helen Tabor wrote a book years ago. Who, Helen Tabor, by the way, was the founder of the Lothrop Family Foundation. Um, a New Home in Manakee is a guide to Reverend John Lothrop's Barnston. And Lucy Loomis, the sponsor of this event, thank you, Lucy, wrote John Lothrop and Barnstable. And uh, Vivian uh, McConkey Adams wrote, Sometimes you just have to move across the ocean. The story of John Lathrop is that A thing again. Um, so that's pretty much what I have, folks. And I appreciate you listening. And I hope that uh, I was at least interesting and or entertaining. Well, thank you. I'm sorry? you want to ask if there are any questions? Yeah, um, I've been advised that I should ask if anybody has any questions. I'm sure you do. I hope I can answer them. But well, let's give it a shot, okay? No, we have one question, to whom would the Reverend appeal to find a better area to move from Situate? That's a very good question. Basically, it's the general, great general court of the county, uh, or Barstable, or excuse me, of uh, Plymouth Plantation, which was since that time has been subdivided into several counties, but 
in the early days, everything pretty much 10 miles south of Boston was Plymouth Plantation. Lazy. Was his church and house the same building, or did he have another church building? Uh, originally, um, everybody met in the Reverend's house. Then they built a new house, and the church services were there. And then ultimately, they did build a, an actual freestanding church building, which is where the East Church is now. And uh, then it moved down the street here to. There's a marker that says the second church parish was there. And um, so that was a long time after Reverend John passed away, however. Anybody else? I think that's it. Wow. <laughs> Almost unscathed. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah, oops. Uh, yes, sir. John Lothrop is associated with the separation of church and state. And frequently you hear that uh, Roger Williams and several others of that later, little bit later era are associated with the separation of church and state. Is there, can you comment on John Lothrop's role in defining the separation of church and state? Was a lot of his thinking and work done while he was in England, or is that something that played out in the U.S.? Well, I have some notes about that. Um, pretty much, I'll just go from the top of my head. Pretty much, the Mayflower Compact that was signed in Provincetown Harbor was almost an exact duplicate of the agreements at the Church of Leiden, which was Henry Jacobs' church early on. And as people came over, they took that same document and they made minor modifications to it. But, um, I never really thought of John Lothrop as being um, a proponent of separation of church and state per se. But with that said, um, he did comment to uh, John Winthrop that he liked being in a place where um, the government didn't have a bishop. Now, Roger Williams was another whole case. He was very progressive. Um, John Williams was the pastor of the church in Salem early on. And um, he basically was invited to leave because they thought he was, thinking was way too radical. He thought, for instance, that the settlers in Salem should have paid the natives for the privilege of moving into their neighborhood. I mean, that was <laughs> That was a non-starter with the people up there. Um, you know, John Williams, uh, Roger Williams rather, is um, credited with starting the uh, Baptist Church in America. He probably had something to do with it, but when he died, he didn't actually belong to any church. He wasn't a pastor in any church either. But I just think, um, coming from England, in the 1620s with Bishop Laud and Charles I and their rather uh, strident rules about what you needed to do to be a good citizen, a lot of people found that pretty repulsive, you know. Hmm. Anything else? No other questions? Okay. Very nice. Thank you, everybody. Let me thank you. you. Want to get in here? Yes. If there are no other questions. I wish to thank Gordon for making the trip down from Marblehead for this, and we invite you to join us next week.
for our next session on the summer speaker series. Thank you very much.